Rick Smith, welcome to ASPE. Thank you. How did you come to help write this report on the Indo-Pacific? The uh, Australia-India Institute, uh, which uh, Professor Amitabh Matu is the uh, uh, director, uh, decided um, a couple of years ago to do a set of reports on uh, Australia-India relations and on matters of interest to both countries. So it's pu published one on uh, perceptions of uh, India in Australia. It's working on a sort of counterpart uh, in India of Australia. Uh, and then it's... Um, uh, the strategic and security interests uh, in the Indian Ocean was another of the series that uh, 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 commissioned itself to do and they approached me as a former Secretary of Defence and uh, someone with a 40 year long interest in India because I served there in the 1970s to uh, help out with that job. Um, the work was done essentially by uh, group of academics on both sides, a number of Indian academics and commentators, and likewise in Australia, and they had a couple of quite high-level meetings, one of which uh, I chaired uh, in Fremantle, and um, uh, brought together these ideas. Then primarily Professor Dennis Rumley edited all that into one, one volume. Is the driving force as much about the differences between India and Australia as any commonalities? I think the driving force was this, that uh, they'd begun a whole new conversation, as they'd say, about the Indian Ocean, uh, triggered, uh, uh, I suppose, by Robert Kaplan a lot, uh, an assertion that the Indian Ocean was now uh, going to be in the 21st century as the Pacific had been in the 20th. Uh, and the question was, well, uh, what does this really mean? In what sense is it going to be important? What particular respects? And what does that mean for Australia uh, and India? Now, there's been a long fascination with the Indian Ocean uh, among West Australian-based politicians. You remember Gordon Freeth lost his seat in 1969 over some assertions he made about uh, uh, Soviet Union being unimportant in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but then Kim Beasley rediscovered the Indian Ocean in the 80s. So this is all just about you being a centre piece. You, you, this is all just about you being a boy from Perth. Perth. Well, so I had that bit of an interest. I mean, I went to school in Fremantle. Fremantle, uh, and then Stephen Smith. Uh, focused on it, and as I say, this was uh, uh, a new focus, uh, a renewed focus on our part, at the same time as Kaplan, as the first mover, had made uh, a, su a success out of uh, uh, his book on the Indian Ocean. So the question that I had as I went into this is, in what respects is the Indian Ocean important? We know why the Pacific is important, and a lot of that grew out of the Second World War, the Korean War, and so on. Uh, uh, but in what respect is the Indian Ocean important? And uh, what this uh, report does really, or well, does two things. Firstly, it's a very useful compendium of almost everything that's ever been written about the many variations of security in the Indian Ocean. Anybody wanting to do work on that subject would be well advised to go to the bibliography here and the footnotes because... But the 250 a, footnotes. 269 footnotes and there's a massive amount of material that's been written over the years but it's all over the place. This book, this report lists it. And, what's the uh, and so it's a compendium in that way. And what's the answer to your, your starting question? Is the Indian Ocean... And, well, that was the next, uh, the second part of it. it. It unravels that whole notion of the Indian Ocean, or as some would say, unpacks it, uh, and really says the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean security uh, uh, is to be talked of in several senses. One is the great strategic sense of uh, the, uh, uh, the sea lanes of communication from the Persian Gulf right through the Straits of Malacca. Um, the, the second is uh, issues arising from failed states and refugee movements and so on uh, in bordering countries. Uh, and then there's a set of issues, uh, including piracy, incidentally. And then there's a set of issues uh, uh, which I'll say describe as sort of sustainable security matters about uh, seabed resources, potential competition for them, and so on. So it unpacks it in, in, those, in those three uh, tiers. Is it something of a win for the Perth, ma Perth Mafia that the Indo-Pacific construct is at the very centre of Australia's new defence white paper? Um, I think that uh, the thinking in defence had already moved in that direction. Uh, the fact that I chaired a couple of sessions here and then was on the ministerial advisory group for the white paper was sort of coincidental in the sense that the very first draft I saw of the white paper, while we're still working on this report, 
had Indo-Pacific in it and thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, my concerns about it at first were that the white paper draft launched immediately into that concept and it needed some introduction about how we'd moved from the Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific and why that was important and in the end that came out. But it was interesting that those things were going on in parallel uh, and as I said, this put, uh, it unpacked, it put flesh on the bones of the broad con uh, claim about the importance of the Indian Ocean. So for Australian strategists, uh, has Australian strategic thinking moved from the Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific and does it see the discussion of the Asian century as being only the economic element of that Indo-Pacific strategic thought? Uh, I wouldn't say it had moved from Graham, it's broadened to include that. It's, uh, uh, we recognised through APEC and other institutions in years past that you, you can't really talk about uh, Asia-Pacific and exclude South Asia from that. It has to be uh, in, involved. Uh, and similarly now at the level of strategic thinking, it's clear that uh, India as an econ economic power, potentially uh, as a military weight, uh, has to be taken into account. And as well the issues of South Asia are of a kind which can uh, affect the, re the wider uh, Asian region. So it was necessary to be more comprehensive in it. There's still a question, of course, about where you draw the line uh, at, uh, at Asia Pacific or even now Indo Pacific. Uh, do you go into the Persian Gulf and onto the Middle East? One of the uh, challenging points, I think, in this report is that when it lists the countries of the Indian Ocean, it reaches as far as Jordan and Iraq. Uh, simply because these countries uh, either touch on the uh, Persian Gulf or the Red Sea or one of the extensions, of, if you like, of the Indian Ocean. Now, some would think that's drawing the, the line pretty wide, and when this book uses the notion Indo-Pacific, it doesn't embrace the Middle East in it. Uh, Canberra bureaucrats, of course, are uh, renowned for being able to hold lots of different complicated concepts in their head at the same time. But what is the more useful construct for a Canberra strategist to think about what he or she is doing? Is it going to be this idea of an Asia century or is, it, is the Indo-Pacific going to be the driving notion? I don't think uh, they're at odds. Uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific as a strategic concept uh, uh, sits very comfortably with the broader uh, framework of, uh, of, the Asian, of the Asian century. Uh, but what's important about Indo-Pacific, of course, is that it means, as a strategic concept, a policy concept, it refers to the strategic, uh, the, the sea lanes of communication from the Persian Gulf uh, through uh, the Straits of Malacca, the South China Sea, uh, up to Japan, uh, if you like, uh, Indo-Pacific, across the United States. That's the most uh, important uh, uh, trade uh, set of trade routes uh, uh, in the world today uh, and to see them as one uh, uh, is to uh, put an appropriate focus on the risks to them and at the same time it defines what what is the importance of the Indian Ocean in global terms. You see the rest of those issues, failing states, piracy, potential rivalry over seabed resources and fisheries, uh, those sorts of issues uh, are of importance to the immediate region, but they don't have global significance. The problem for me was that the waters that wash uh, uh, Cape Lewin, uh, even Cottesloe Beach, uh, are, are not of great strategic significance, not to world powers. Um, the waters that uh, run you know, out of the Persian Gulf and across the Arabian Sea uh, and through to the Straits of Malacca, they are. So, uh, uh, I wanted to get away from the notion myself of saying, gee, the Indian Ocean's important, we'd better worry about Cottesloe Beach and Cape Lewin. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is the northern part of the Indian Ocean, and that fits into this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept. So for defence, it's really about sea lanes of communication, which probably in a way brings you very quickly back to Southeast Asia and choke points. That's right. And sea lanes of communication I've talked about, you know, Persian Gulf through to Japan, but of course this embraces from northwestern Australia north too, through the archipelago from south to north as well as from west to east and east to west. Uh, so uh, the energy and resources that we feed uh, northwards is part of the Indo-Pacific, those sea lanes as well. 
The report talks about the argument in, that has been running in Australia about whether Australia would have to choose between China and the United States and, and raises another way to think of it, saying, well, maybe the real choice Australia is going to have to face in the 21st century is a choice between India and China. How do you conceptualise that? Well, uh, I just don't accept binary choices. That is not what good foreign policy or even strategic policy could ever be about. Um, what you do, do is maximise, optimise your interests with all parties, not make choices. And I don't see that as being a realistic choice that we have to make. Is another way, though, of talking about it to say that this is a polite way to discuss declining relative US power? I don't uh, uh, think it is that. It is a way of... Uh, defining a concept which the US can be engaged in. But not dominate. And uh, not necessarily dominate. I mean, the, uh, the important thing about this Indo-Pacific strategic concept, of, uh, as I've described it, is that it is inclusive. It includes China. Now, when Indo-Pacific was first mooted a couple of years ago, uh, and at that time I was a sceptic because, you know, I'm saying Cottesloe Beach, uh, you know, American... Chinese interests, what are we talking about here? But now that I've defined it in terms of those sea lanes um, uh, uh, and their continuity from Persian Gulf to Japan and so on, uh, I can see now that it is an inclusive concept. But when it was first mooted, uh, the Chinese were very wary about it. They thought that it was a way of uh, uh, a further you know, uh, a brick in the containment of China. And I think it's very important to stress that this is sort of Asia-Pacific plus, and uh, the China is very much part of Asia-Pacific. This is Asia-Pacific plus. So in my uh, conception, and the, the conception reflected in this report, the big strategic issues of security of uh, sea lanes and uh, so on, um, uh, they're dealt with uh, at, in the grand councils of the region, if I can call them that, the East Asia Summit, the um, ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN uh, Plus Defence Ministers meetings, even APEC leaders and so on. Um, and the very local issues of seabed security and uh, security of seabed resources and so on, they can be dealt with in the regional organisations. Now that's pretty much the way we've dealt with the Pacific over the years. The big picture issues are dealt with in those grand councils, the South Pacific uh, 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 commission and the South Pacific Forum or the Pacific Forum, Pacific Island Forum deal with the immediate local issues. Uh, in the case of the Indian Ocean, you say the big picture issues that connect the Indian Ocean with uh, the Pacific, uh, they're dealt with in the Grand Councils and the immediate issues of fisheries, resources, all the rest of it are dealt with in this thing called IOARC, the Indian Ocean Regional Organisation for Cooperation. Very good. Pretty close. It's pretty close, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's a measure of the dysfunctionality of those processes, of course, that they've got such a clumsy name. And that they have not got very far at all. And that they don't include Pakistan. A, a debate for another day. They, yeah, no, but I do think that uh, uh, if uh, it, it may be helpful from the Indian point of view uh, if you say uh, IOARC is an organisation devoted to those sort of micro and regional issues. We're not trying to play great power uh, interests into that. We'll deal with them over there. That might help uh, in advancing the uh, IOR uh, and uh, its effectiveness. If Australia accepts the Indo-Pacific as, as the defining strategic construct, how does that change the way Australia structures its defence force. And does the new white paper reflect any thinking about how Australia has to change to respond to the end of it? I think, from my point of view at least, uh, the white paper um, uses the Indo-Pacific notion as a policy construct, not as a force determinant. Now, you can argue about whether it ever used Asia-Pacific as a force determinant. Um, the force determinants are four, the principal tasks, as they call them, the first is the defence of Australia, etc., uh, the uh, deter or defeat. The second is uh, uh, the immediate region, um, uh, the Pacific Island States, Timor-Leste. And the third is contribute to security uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, contribute to. Uh, 
uh, with particular focus on the immediate uh, north of the archipelago, Southeast Asia. That uh, is to some degree a force structuring element, but the contribute to uh, is only very loosely so. But if we were really deciding that Indo-Pacific was going to drive the way we, we thought about structuring our force, what sort of different force would we have? You'd then go into uh, you know, uh, more ships, uh, more, submarine, more submarines, uh, probably more air aircraft than uh, any government has so far contemplated and certainly that the white paper um, affords. So at the moment it's, uh, it helps forge policy, but it doesn't that's drive, right. But it doesn't drive spending? But that's right. Is that a good thing? That's a necessary thing. At the centre of this report, naturally, is the idea of Australia and India mm. starting to work together. Mm. Given the history of the Australian mm. Indonesia, mm. the history of the Australian India relationship, yeah. uh, where we've agreed on virtually nothing, yes. why will we be able to do it in the future? Yeah, you, it, it, is, it is true, it hasn't been easy. We've been uh, on the uh, uh, opposite sides of a divide for many years. Uh, the divide uh, of the Cold War, where we were, of course, very clearly allied to the United States. India um, was at best not aligned, though concluded a treaty with the Soviet Union in 1971. Um, uh, we were an increasingly open economy. Uh, 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 India remained a Nehruvian socialist closed economy, at least till the 1990s, and is only quite slowly changing that. We thought the rate of change was greater than it has proved to be. Um, so those basic divides have broken down, but India is still, uh, um, still sees itself and wants to be an independent player in strategic terms. It doesn't want permanent alliances in the sense that uh, we are married to the United States uh, and faithful uh, to uh, that partner. Uh, India is going to be, I'm reluctant to use the word uh, promiscuous, but it's going to make its own decisions issue by issue. I use the term and others might want to test it. There's, there's an element of Gaulism, uh, an Asian Gaulist India. You know, they want to retain their own nuclear capacity, their own capacity to make decisions. Now, that's not a real divide, but it does under, underscore a difference in strategic approaches. I think, again, that having defined this notion uh, of uh, Indo-Pacific with a separate set of Indian Ocean issues, this gives, um, gives us a new uh, framework uh, within which to talk to uh, India, uh, which uh, I hope works its way around what they might have seen as a continuing divide. Finally then, a new framework to talk to India or just another new framework to argue with India? Uh, to talk to, I hope, and uh, look, the will is there on both sides to do more in the defence cooperation, naval exercises and so on, but I think both sides are very frank that resources make that hard. Uh, the Indian Navy is, is growing, but uh, you know what matters is not just the ships you have, but what operating budget you have. Uh, exercises far down into the uh, Indian Ocean, not yet for them. And from my, our point of view, we do pass exes as our ships go to and from the Gulf, but that's the most we're likely to be able to afford for some time to come. And as a former uh, ambassador to Indonesia, would you see Australia always putting more energy into Indonesia than it does into India? Uh, I think so, yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, the issues... So it's not uh, just India that's going to be promiscuous? Uh, the, the, we're not promiscuous. I don't think there's any inconsistency in that. Uh, but we, we will... Um, uh, you know, our, our interests with Indonesia are much more immediate than those with uh, India. So that starts to set up something of a hierarchy within this Indo-Pacific idea? Of course, if you're talking about uh, Australia's relationships, uh, there's... Uh, I'm always reluctant to use a hierarchy, the term hierarchy because there comes a, a time when the least significant state suddenly becomes terribly important to you for reasons that we can't foretell at any particular time. But uh, maybe they're, you know, they're holding Australian uh, uh, hostages or something mad in some tiny state and suddenly that's number one. You can't go to them and say, help us. They say, well, hang on, but you rated as 59 on the chart. Why would we? So you've got to avoid hierarchies. Uh, but the Indo-Pacific isn't about Australia's relationships with the region. It's about Australia's interests in the region, but it's a region-wide concept, 
which we, uh, if it takes hold, uh, will be relevant to all the countries of the region, uh, not just a factor of Australia's relationships. Rick Smith, thank you. Thank you.